Hello there. Before we get started on today's episode, I'd like to ask a short favor. If you're interested in either of the two books that I have written and I'm about to release, head on over to my website at theanxioustruth.com slash books. There you can learn about both books, one of which is free, and you can get on my mailing list to be notified when each book is released and how you can get it. I would really appreciate that. Okay, let's get rolling. Welcome to That Anxiety Guy, Episode 6, How Panic Attack Can Become Panic Disorder. Hello everybody, Drew here, thatanxietyguide.com. Thanks for swinging by to listen. Today we're going to talk about something that I think is pretty important. We're actually going to take panic attacks and panic disorder all the way back to the beginning in your life, and in my life too, I guess. So we're going to talk about how a panic attack and the first few panic attacks in your life can become panic disorder. We're going to talk about that mechanism. We're going to go over the difference between panic attacks and panic disorder. And we're going to talk about why understanding that and really getting your brain around it can really change the direction you go in terms of recovering from panic and anxiety issues in your life. It really does make a big difference. It's important. So let's think back to the very first time that you ever had a panic attack. We don't want to dwell on it because we don't want to freak anyone out, but just think back on it for a few seconds. And I'm guessing, if you're like me, the thing that comes rushing back when you think about that very first episode is probably two things. There's fear. And fear was huge for me. I thought I was dying the first time I had a panic attack. I was convinced of it. And then there's confusion or bewilderment. I know Claire Weeks, Dr. Weeks calls it or called it bewilderment a lot because it's a new experience. It's something that we've not had happen to us before the first time it ever happens. So you're confronted with these extremely powerful physical sensations and feelings. And we know all about panic symptoms, so we don't have to go over them now but extremely powerful wave of, of symptoms that sure don't feel good. And then that kind of triggers an even bigger wave in your mind of catastrophic thinking and what if thinking and oh my God, and that just brings on huge intense waves of fear. So by all accounts in that very first situation, that first panic attack that we've never experienced before in our lives, we are 100% convinced and rightly so that we are in absolute mortal danger. Most people will say that they either thought they were going to die or be severely physically damaged by something like a stroke, or they were going to go insane, or somehow lose their minds, or somehow disintegrate or slip away. That's a common theme with a lot of people. But suffice to say that the fear is of something very, very bad happening. So as human beings do, in our quest for safety and comfort, and with a survival instinct kind of hardwired into us, we begin to engage immediately in behaviors that we think will save us. You may dial 911 or whatever your emergency number is in the country you live in, and you may wind up in the emergency room in a hospital. Many, many people have that happen the first time they have a panic attack because they just don't know any different, and nobody would blame them for that. But I want you to think, if that was you and you did reach out and wind up in the emergency room of a hospital, I want you to think about what they did because it's going to be important to know that they didn't really do anything to save you. Most times... The emergency room winds up pumping you full of a tranquilizer of some kind to calm you down once they're sure that there's nothing wrong and you actually are just experiencing a panic attack. Or you may call somebody close to you, a spouse, a parent, a sibling, a good friend, someone you can reach out to to help you get through it. Uh, there's a lot of physical activity that happens. There may be pacing, running. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens. I know there's those hot and cold flashes. Some people literally will wind up ripping their clothing off to try and cool off or somehow getting over the oven or the stove to heat up if they're having a cold flush in their body. We engage in behaviors that we think will keep us safe. We try and flee the danger. We try to escape it. We try to counteract it. Now, in the end, because the human body has a limited ability to pump adrenaline on a consistent basis, that first panic attack does end. Now, it may you know, flow and ebb, but that panic attack ultimately will end. And I know that's another discussion. Many people will say, oh, no, I can have panic attacks that last for hours. Physiologically, you cannot. So it's, it's the interpretation that's faulty there. But that'll be another episode. So that first panic attack, it may have lasted just a few minutes, if you're one of the lucky ones, or it may have felt like it stretched on for hours. But in the end, your body does run out of gas, and you do come down. Now, you feel terrible afterwards, of course, but the danger or the imminent danger does 
appear to pass. So let's take a look at what happened here. And I want you to think about the person who has never been afraid of a dog in their entire life and is in a park having a picnic, petting what appears to be a friendly dog, and gets bitten in the hand and winds up having to need stitches and a tetanus shot and all of that stuff. That person can immediately develop a severe phobia of dogs and not want to go near another dog for the rest of their days. And everybody understands that, and no one would question why. You've been bit by a dog, so now you're afraid of dogs. Well, the same mechanism is at place here, is at play with us. So when that first panic attack ended, let's think about what just happened. We had this terrible, horrific experience kind of jump at us from the blue. We engaged in all these safety behaviors. We called someone, we went to the hospital, we paced, we ran, we drank water, we did whatever we thought we had to do, and we got to the end. So we got safe. So we actually learn, as human beings will do, that there was danger and that we had to escape from it and that we should not go near that danger again. But more importantly, we somehow form the faulty connection between the behaviors we engaged in and having lived to tell the tale. So in our minds, we think those things that we did, the pacing, the calling your spouse, the calling your sister, the running outside, the going to the hospital, somehow or other those things saved you from that imminent danger associated with that panic attack. But in the end, we know that that's actually not true, yet that's the connection that forms cognitively, cognitively in our brains just because of the way we come wired from the factory. So now let's talk about how a panic attack can differ and become panic disorder. So now you've had your first panic attack, and we may already have formed some of those uh, out-of-whack cognitive connections between safety behaviors, danger, perceived danger, real danger. We know the, the, the deal there. Now let's talk about the difference between a panic attack, which is a discrete physical event that has a beginning and an end, and panic disorder, which is actually characterized by how you live your life between panic attacks. So let me explain that for just a second here. A panic attack is a physical event. Yes, you feel fear. You have thought patterns triggered when you feel the physical sensations of panic. Sometimes when you get down the road, you can't tell which comes first, the thoughts or the, or the physical symptoms. But primarily, a panic attack is identified by the presence of several of a list of physical symptoms without any underlying physiological cause. And we all know what those symptoms are. Racing heart. Shortness of breath, dizziness, unsteadiness, depersonalization, derealization, hot and cold flashes. We know all the symptoms. When you have more than a few of those, that would be called a panic attack. And it has a start, and it does have an end. You're going to run out of gas. You cannot panic for hours and hours on end. The difference between a panic attack, which is an actual physical event, and panic disorder, and I alluded to this in one of my very first episodes, is that the panic attack is physical and a discrete event that you can identify. The panic disorder is cognitive and it's actually characterized by how you live between panic attacks. That means that when you begin to anticipate the next panic episode, or when you begin to fear that next panic episode, for some of us, when you become obsessed and consumed with when this may happen, oh my God, is it going to happen? And more than that, when you begin to engineer your specific circumstances and often your lifestyle to guarantee either that you won't run into panic, you try and avoid it, or you try and engineer your circumstance so that you know that you can engage in your safety rituals if it does happen, now you have morphed into panic disorder. So it's not what you do during your panic attacks that identifies panic disorder. It identifies what happens between them. So there are people who can have panic attacks on a reasonably regular basis, but pay them no mind until they happen again. So I would have to say that at this point in my life, I'm one of those people. So I used to have panic disorder, pretty severe. Now it is possible for me to have a panic attack now and then, but once that panic attack is over and I, and I start to feel a little better physically and I'm not so wiped out, I'm really not even thinking about the next one. Maybe I'll have another one that day. Maybe I won't have another one for another 10 years. I don't know, and honestly, I don't care. So that's the difference between somebody who has panic attacks and somebody who has panic disorder. It's how you live your life in between those panic attacks that defines the disorder. So the important thing about that is that the panic attack is physical and the panic disorder is more cognitive and behavioral in nature. That's really important because when you are trying to deal with these issues, you want to begin to recover from panic disorder. You're tired of being held hostage by it. You're tired of the way you have to live your life because of your panic. 
Many people spend a tremendous amount of time and energy and effort trying to focus on the physical part. There's a tremendous amount of discussion. There's a tremendous amount of effort spent on how to stop the symptoms of panic. Those things, you know, there's a lot of methods to do that. They range all the way from medication all the way down to tapping and other rituals you can be, you know, engage in mainly focused on things that you will swallow, drink, sniff, rub, wear, do. If you're spending your time trying to either eliminate the symptoms, the physical part of panic, or only concerned with knocking those symptoms out when they pop up, you're actually on the wrong track. If your life is governed by panic disorder, you are curtailing the way you live, you're avoiding places, you don't go certain places, You are worried all the time what may happen if your anxiety pops up. You have panic disorder, and if you are focused on the symptoms of your panic attacks and your anxiety, you are doing it wrong. So you need to understand that the disorder, panic disorder, is cognitive in nature. I'm not saying abandon taking care of yourself physically, because we all need to take care of ourselves physically. But you need to focus on the cognitive and behavioral aspects of the problem. Right? Change your focus and start working on the cognitive and behavioral parts of that. Now, the bad news is you're going to have to actually start working on facing the fear without engaging in your safety behaviors because this is how we start to unlearn what we have learned. Right? So the good news is anything that we learn, we can unlearn. The bad news is it's going to take a lot of courage and commitment and persistence because while we can develop a phobia almost instantaneously, we're wired to do that. And I think that's probably because of our survival instinct. While we can learn to be afraid almost instantly, learning to not be afraid takes longer and it's harder, but it's doable. It's doable by many, many, many people. Millions of people around the world have overcome this. And your goal is really to get to the point where you may actually be a person, a human being who occasionally has panic attacks, but you no longer have panic disorder. And when you eliminate the disorder because you've unlearned and you've broken those faulty cognitive connections between I must do these things to stay safe and the actual event of a panic attack, which while uncomfortable and and scary is not harmful. Once you've broken those connections and stopped those behaviors, those safety rituals and avoidance behaviors that perpetuate the disorder, once you've broken that, which is a cognitive and behavioral thing, you're done. You may find that you never have a panic attack again. That's possible. But really and truly, if you've done it correctly and got to that point, you actually won't care if you ever have a panic attack again. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But it won't matter. Having a panic attack, even a severe panic attack, would kind of be akin to banging your toe on the dining room chair in the middle of the night. It really hurts. You might have to limp around for an hour or two and you hate it. It's a terrible inconvenience in your life. You won't want to do it again, but you won't pay it much more mind than that. Or even having a day where you have a lot of high anxiety, maybe you had a panic attack, maybe you're still feeling very anxious that day. Generally speaking, you don't ascribe any specific significance to it much more than a normal person, so-called normal person would, if they have a day where maybe they have a little head cold or a sinus cold and they're under the weather. It's an inconvenience. Nobody wants it. It'll happen. You move along. So that's the difference between... A panic attack, panic disorder, and really knowing that difference will point you in the right direction to work cognitive and behaviorally toward overcoming the disorder, as opposed to spending all of your time trying to deal with the physical sensations of panic and anxiety, because that ultimately turns out to be a dead end. I hope this all makes sense. I think it's an important topic. I know that for some people, it's a little bit controversial. They don't like to hear some of that. I think primarily because none of us really wants to have to intentionally go into situations where we are afraid or uncomfortable, but that's kind of the way it is, and it's been proven time and time again to work for many, many, many people. So now that we know the difference between panic attack and panic disorder, and we understand the need to work cognitively and behaviorally as opposed to physically, In the next podcast episode, we're going to take a look at some practical things we we can begin to do in order to face our fears directly without adding our safety behaviors and avoidance behaviors. And this will help us to start actually break those faulty cognitive connections that I've been talking about. There's going to be a lot of really good practical information, so I hope you stop by. In the meanwhile, I do want to hear from you. So whether you have a positive comment, a negative comment, a question, or a suggestion for a future podcast topic, I'd like to hear it. Probably the best place to start would be on my website, thatanxietyguide.com. Every episode is posted in its entirety. You can listen right on the website. 
and every episode also has a comment section. Feel free to use it. If you prefer social media, you'll find links on every website page to my Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus pages. You can get me there. I even have Tumblr. I love Tumblr. If you like Tumblr, I'm thatanxietyguy.tumblr.com. Check that out. And there's also my email list. You can sign up on the website. I use it only to notify people of new episodes. It's a great way to know when, when a new episode is out, so feel free to use that as well. Now, a special request of my friends on iTunes. If you're listening via iTunes, the iOS podcast app, or on your computer in iTunes, do me a favor, take 60 seconds, rate the podcast. A positive rating always helps. If you're enjoying the podcast, a review helps even more. So if you take 60 seconds to give us a good rating, maybe write a few words as to why you think the podcast is great. It certainly helps spread the word so that other people who may use the help can find us a little bit more easily. So I thank you all in advance for that help. It is always appreciated. Okay, that's it. I'm going to get out of here. Looking forward to see you guys in the next episode. And remember what I always say, keep moving forward because every step forward is a good step forward, no matter how small it may be. Have a great day. Hey, what's up, guys? Drew here. In the five years that I've done the podcast, I've never had a sponsor. But now it's time for me to put in a little plug for the day job, the business that I own. And that business is managed WordPress hosting. So if you have a website and it runs WordPress and you'd like WordPress hosting that makes WordPress faster, more secure, and way easier than you ever imagined it would be, then check out Helix. You can find us online at imhelix.com. That's I-A-M-H-E-L-I-X.com. We took a long time to build Helix. I'm super proud of it. It works spectacularly. We take really good care of our customers, and I promise we would take really good care of you too. So if you're in the market for WordPress hosting that will blow your mind, check out Helix. I would appreciate the consideration. I thank you for coming by and listening, and I'll see you the next time.